So thanks everybody for joining in this webinar, which we're going to talk about gut health and really that's talking about stomach and colonic ulcers. What is most important to remember is that while we are in the industry of talking about supplements, they are very small in their requirement in compared to the rest of the diet. The forage, the hay and pasture is the most important part of the horse's diet. And as we go through this talk, what I want to show you is why we have all of these gut health issues at present. Why on earth has this become such a big problem? And I think when, when we go through the progression of how we manage horses and what we do with horses, it will become very clear why this is such a big problem. So we'll talk about digestive function, and I know that a lot of you have seen these slides talking about digestive function, but it's not um, ever a <clears throat> problem to reiterate. Talk about those ulcers and the different forage requirements. <clears throat> so digestive function. On the left-hand side, this is what horses are designed to do. They're designed to eat a wide variety of different forages, nibble constantly, graze between 12 and 18 hours a day. I usually say about 17 hours a day. They move around, they eat off the ground, they stand in a herd. There is very little stress. When they put their head on the ground and eat, they have natural drainage of the respiratory tract, increased chewing time. It is amazing how much it increases the amount of times that they chew and the amount of saliva that they produce when they eat off the ground. It maintains proper teeth alignment. If horses can chew properly, they'll produce more saliva. <clears throat> but on the right hand side, this is more typical of what we see today. We feed horses a much higher cereal grain based diet because they're living longer and we're expecting them to do more. So they do need more nutrients and more calories. But it's the way that we feed them that. We feed them meals. They consume it quickly. They don't mimic that natural but grazing behavior by having forage available to them all the time. We've got increased acidity in parts of the GI tract that are not supposed to be acidic. We also feed horses at chest height, which significantly decreases the amount of chewing time. What does chewing do? It produces saliva. Saliva is one of the first lines of defense in buffering stomach acid. You take that away and immediately we open the floodgates for that acid to get strong and we take away one of the horse's natural defenses towards that strong gastric acid. Taking away the acid completely by using gastrogod or ulcergod is a short-term fix. The horse has acid in its stomach for a reason, but we'll get to that. This is the teeth. These circles here are the actual movement of that bottom jaw. So when your horse eats hay or grass, the bottom jaw sweeps in a much wider motion. When they eat a lot of pellets or pelleted forages, the jaw sweeps are much shorter. The longer they're chewing, the more saliva they produce. <clears throat> Horse out in the pasture grazing, he will chew about 60,000 times a day. When we stick a horse in a stall and we give him, you know, ample amount of hay and anywhere between 6 and 12 pounds of, of grain a day, he's only going to chew at most 30,000 times. So you've, just by changing the management of the horse, cut in half the chewing time. In doing that, you've cut in half the amount of saliva that is produced. If we move then to the esophagus, esophagus, if I'm choking, I can't breathe, but the horse has two distinct pipes here, the food tube, which is the esophagus, or the um, trachea, which is the windpipe what, that they breathe through. <clears throat> so you'll notice if a horse is choking, they're constantly coughing and they're trying to dislodge that. And in a worst case scenario, they will end up actually inhaling that and getting a secondary pneumonia from inhaling food particles. But the esophagus or the food tube, it's a muscular tube and this thing called peristaltic contractions slowly pushes food down into the stomach. Well, there's no way to really exercise that tube. So you have to mimic how, the, how it's designed to be used and that's small amounts of food constantly. 
not large boluses of food. So when you stick a horse in a stall who hasn't had a lot of hay, hasn't been nibbling constantly, doesn't know when you're coming back and all of a sudden, you know, he's overweight and you've got him on a diet and you give him some grain and he eats it really quickly, that esophagus just doesn't have the muscular power to push it down. So the horse chokes. It's not about what you feed him. It's not about whether you fed them pellets or beet pulp that wasn't wet. It is 100% to do with the horse's dentition and the way he eats. So move to the stomach now. <clears throat> Very small in relation to the rest of the digestive tract. If you cut a window in it, we've got this glandular mucosa down here or the protected region. That's an actual photograph. And it's protected by this mucus coating. And that mucus coating is there to protect that tissue from acid because there are little cells down here, parietal cells, that secrete acid, but they secrete acid continually. Unlike in a dog and a cat where they will sense food, see food, and they'll sec start secreting acid, the horse secretes acid continually. That acid will then splash up into this non-protected region and cause gastric ulcers, usually right along this line here. So if we think about that horse in the wild, he's grazing, he's chewing, there is a mat of grass that sits on that acid, stops it from splashing up. There's also all that saliva, which is more neutral, and it uh, buffers that stomach acid. So our horses, well, they don't have the saliva and they don't have that grass sitting, or hay sitting on top of that acid to hold it down. That is the way it's meant to work. If we move now to the small intestine, there are enzymes here that break down food. In particular, there's an enzyme called amylase. It breaks down starch. And it, there's only a certain amount of it. So if we overload the horse's diet with undigest, unprocessed grains or large meals, any more than, say, three to four pounds of grain in a single meal, it's going to flow quickly through the stomach. It's going to go into the small intestine. All the amylase will get used up. There'll be more starch that needs to be digested, and it'll end up here in the hindgut. Now, if we're using a gastrogut or ulcergut and we're turning off the acid here completely, and I'm not saying these are bad products, these are fantastic products, but they're meant to be used short term, two to four weeks max. But what we see is this chronic misuse of them where we're continually uh, have those horses on those products. And so what happens is the acid is in the stomach to break down food. Well, we've turned that off. So now we've got this non-digested food flowing to the small intestine. Amylase can't keep up. So it flows into the hindgut. Now we are creating this acidic hindgut issue. And so the incidence of hindgut ulcers has significantly increased. If we look from the cecum on back, this is the hindgut of the horse. It's bacterial fermentation. We're breaking down fiber here, but we're using bacteria. And there are a million and one different types of bacteria, but they're in different groups. They're gonna break down fiber. They're going to produce at lactic acid, other volatile fatty acids. They're going to utilize those volatile fatty acids. So there are lots of different roles. Um, these fiber digesting bacteria like it when it's around 6.2 to 6.8, which is close to neutral. The starch digesting bacteria, they prefer it when it's a little bit more acidic, but that acidity then causes further problems. The large colon, it's where we break down the majority of our fiber. Um, if we <clears throat> have ever stuck our hand in a bale of hay or in a um, a, a silage pit, it's very warm, same principle occurs here. We've got those bacteria breaking down the fiber, byproduct is heat. So um, with this never-ending winter that we seem to be in, um, continue to make sure your horses have plenty of fiber because it helps keep them warm. Then here in the small colon, really all we're doing is uh, absorbing moisture and forming fecal balls. So if forage is the key here, the, the fact that we have taken horses away from that natural grazing behavior and we have stuck them in stalls and they really don't get the quantity of forage that they need, but it goes one step further than that. 
it's supplying them that forage in a manner that is more natural. So we need to be mimicking grazing behavior. They need to have access to that forage for 17 hours out of the day, not just two times a day. Um, so it, it goes further than just meeting their forage requirement amount, but their the management of that forage. So you think about what a horse gets when they're out in a field, when they're grazing. You know, he a horse will comfortably consume between two and two and a half percent of body weight. Uh, 20 to 25 pounds. They're also exercising because they're wandering around. Um, you know, the pasture intake data that we have says that they may consume between one and one and a half pounds per hour. Obviously, it's variable. They're not going to consume that on the pasture on the bottom, but quite easily done on that pasture on the top. Um, out of that 24-hour period, they're going to wander, graze for about 17 hours out of the day, which you know, for that 1,000-pound horse, that's 24 pounds of dry pasture they're consuming, which is right up around that 2.5% of body weight. We do know, though, but that based on our management of horses, number one, we just don't have the land mass um, to manage horses with that much pasture. But pasture is also unreliable. We have drought, we have seasonality. You know, I go to Texas or Florida or California and there's really not a lot of grass. So that's seasonality, sorry, uh, and availability. But forage in whatever form you give it to the horse is still absolutely critical and we still need to try and mimic that grazing behavior. So what does that mean? Well, an absolute bare minimum would be 1% of body weight. Anything less than that, and I'll show you on the next slide, you're going to turn off the gut. So at 1% of body weight, the horse will lose weight. Um, he probably won't be that healthy, but his gut will slowly keep functioning. If I want a horse on a weight loss program, I'm going to go to about 1.2% of body weight. So for that 1,000-pound horse, that's about 12 pounds of forage. <clears throat> more, more, I prefer that you feed between 1.5 and 2.5 percent of body weight. So that's anywhere from 15 to 25 pounds of forage per day. They're really not going to eat <clears throat> any more than 30, 35 pounds. Um, so if we look now to a study that was done in ponies and they fed different rates <coughs> of forage <clears throat> and they looked at digestibility. So forget about all these crazy numbers. Really all you need to look at these numbers here. They had one group of ponies, and they, this is grouped down the bottom here, they were feeding 0.6% of body weight. This group here in the middle, that was 1.1% of body weight, so close to that um, lose weight. And then um, this group here was eating 1.5, let's say 1.6% of body weight. And then we had this ad lib group. They could eat as much as they wanted. And they ended up sitting right around 2% of body weight. So you can see if we look at the actual digestibility, and this is a measure of the function of the digestive tract. Is it working or is it not? <coughs> you can see that anywhere from the 1.1 to the 2% of body weight, anywhere in this range, we've got about 50% digestibility which is normal. Even the best quality hay is not going to be more than around 50 to 52 percent digestible. So this fits with our understanding of the digestibility of the gut. Look at this though. When you start to feed any less than one percent of body weight, this is a down around here by 0.6 percent of body weight, the digestibility in the gut is only around 34 percent. What that's telling us is we are really turning off the digestive capacity of the stomach and of the hindgut. Just like how the small intestine and the esophagus are muscular tubes that need to, the way they're designed is they're constantly working. They're constantly pushing food through. When muscles contract, we've got a blood supply coming to that region. You know yourself, if your muscle, if you break your arm and you're not using your arm, your muscles atrophy very quickly. Blood supply is not coming to that area. So what happens in these horses when you really feed them, you don't feed them enough forage, 
then we start to atrophy the gut. We know from other studies that those intestinal cells actually start to die off. So it's absolutely critical that you need to feed your horses plenty of forage and you need to feed it in a manner that is mimicking that grazing behavior. And what happens if you don't? Well, obviously I've shown you the worst case scenario, your gut starts to die, but we know that it gets very acidic back there, causing colic, gastric ulcers, cribbing, wood chewing, a lot of these behavioral issues. You may have a horse and you've corrected all of those, but you've corrected the reason why they started. You know, maybe it started because he wasn't having enough fiber or he was bored and you correct that, but now they're learned behaviors and very difficult to get rid of. <clears throat> so how do we extend that grazing time? How do we give that fat pony 1.2% of his body weight, but then ensure that he's grazing on that for 24 hours or 17 hours? And that's where you have to be ingenious and I used to say the horse magazine had done a really good article on different types of slow feeders because you can go to any trade show and buy one, but they're very expensive. Um, but uh, I've seen studies done on the nibble nets, the nets with much smaller holes versus medium sized holes versus big holes. And they definitely do slow the horse down. Um, <clears throat> But if you, any of you use Pinterest, go on Pinterest and Pinterest slow feeders for horses. And if you're handy with a drill and some wood, then I guarantee you can make yourselves all kinds of different slow feeders. Now, I, I did have a comment recently when I showed this picture, which is a metal grate that slides down on top of the hay that in colder climates, if you're using these in the wintertime, um, they can actually hurt the horse. Um, so there are also kind of um, elastic, they're like a, a, a bungee setup that the that will float down. So there are different options, but go on Pinterest. But the goal is whatever works in your management program, you've got to mimic that grazing behavior. You can't just be feeding 1.2 or two and a half percent of body weight and doing it in one or two meals. You've got to mimic that grazing behavior. So let's get to the, the meat of it all. Gastric ulcers, about 90% of performance horses have gastric ulcers, but this is the number here that I think we should all be concerned about. This is rising. Over 60% have colonic ulcers and over half the population have them in both locations. Now this was done in 2005 and I guarantee you these numbers are higher. <clears throat> if you look at different disciplines, um, you know, we can see that uh, racing horses, harness horses. This here, these numbers here really resonate with the management of horses. These horses out of everyone are stuck in stalls more than others. Sick or starved falls, 100% incidence. But your race horses, harness horses, these horses are stuck in stalls. They live in stalls. Um, <clears throat> what's causing these gastric ulcers? <clears throat> this scenario here, this horse, standing in a stall, excuse me one second. With nothing to chew on. He's fasting. We're giving him meals. We're giving him high grain diets, low roughage diets. Transporting him, stabling him, intense exercise, long-term use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like bute. Well, what are you going to notice in your horse? It's not like, you know, strangles, which is very evident. They have pus coming out of their nose and uh, out of lesions on their throat. It's overall, a lot of small things add up. But one of the first things you'll notice is their behavior changes. Some horses get nervous, others get aggressive. Some stop eating or they're continuing to eat, but they just don't seem to be gaining any weight. Their hair coat changes, teeth grinding, clenching. When you go to tighten up the girth or the harness on a buggy, um, they're really uncomfortable. They just don't want to move forward. Sometimes everything's fine, except when you get on the horse and going to the right, he's uncomfortable. <clears throat> when you exercise horses, that, that, um, there's a lot of pressure on the stomach and it squeezes that acid upward. Well, let's look at, look at this chewing. I mentioned how much chewing is changed based on the placement of the food, at chest height or on the ground. So let's take that two pounds of grain and we put it on the ground, in a bucket on the ground. He's going to chew a thousand times. 
two pounds of hay and we put it on the ground. He's going to chew 2,000 times. Two pounds of sweet feed or grain and we put it at chest height. He's going to chew between 350 and 500 times. That's significantly decreasing our saliva. So I hope I'm with my story here, I'm showing you why gastric and colonic ulcers are such a big problem. They are 100% because of us. So if we look at this, this was a study done at the vet school here at Virginia Tech, and they actually stuck a little pH meter down in the horse's stomach, and they measured the acidity, frequently measured the acidity for 24 hours. And this 4 pH here, anything above that was good, anything below that was too strong. And they give them access, free access to grass hay. And you can see the majority of the time those peaks are above four, so that's good. Now we take the same group of horses and we don't give them any access to any forage or feed for 24 hours. Nothing. And you can see there are one, two, three, four times, five, maybe six times in that 24 hour period where the acid is actually above the good range and it's most of the time it's down here in this bad range less than four what i want to point out is after just one hour we had a ph between one and two you stick your finger in that it's going to burn your finger by 18 hours we had bleeding lesions but as little as six hours may increase the uh, risk of ulcers because as little as six hours of, of no feed intake, we have reddening of that stomach lining. What is not uncommon is we feed our horses at five o'clock at night. They're done everything by seven. It took as little as 30 minutes for it to pass through the stomach. And we don't go out and feed them again until seven o'clock the next morning. That's 12 hours where they're not eating anything. That's mimicking this 12 hour of feed deprivation. So by 18 hours, we had bleeding lesions. By six hours, we had already reddening of the stomach lining. Um, this is just showing how as you exercise, you really press the, the abdominal pressure squeezing on the stomach. It's pushing that acid up. Uh, another time you can think about it would be during pregnancy. So what are you going to do? Well, with these gastric ulcers, we know that alfalfa is high in calcium. That is going to help to buffer that stomach acid. Frequent meals mimic graving behavior. DDA will help to stimulate appetite. A lot of these horses lose their appetite. Um, the DAC oil will help with um, providing weight gain without a lot of extra grains and the cool gut. And we'll talk about the cool gut a little bit more, but let's move on to colonic ulcers. Again, meal feeding, high grain diets, low roughage diets, but add in now these bad bacteria and parasites that may also wear away at that lining inflammation. It's not meant to look like this. It's meant to be nice and clean. Uh, it's a lot more, uh, uh, less frequent as we saw from the graph, but a lot more severe. Intermittent colic-like symptoms, anorexia, fever, diarrhea. Your horses get dehydrated very quickly. Um, what a veterinarian may look for, because there's no, you can't scope the hindgut of the horse, but they'll look at anemia symptoms, uh, changes in white blood cell counts, uh, low blood proteins, and your inflammatory proteins. So what are you going to do? Well, for about four weeks, we recommend pelleted or cubed forages because that long stem forage can be a little abrasive. Um, Dr. Frank Andrews, who is the developer of uh, GastroGuard and UltraGuard, also recommends that um, yeast can help stabilize the acidity in the hindgut. It's a key component of the cool gut. It's also in the DDA. And again, if we can add oil to give extra calories without giving a lot of um, grain for weight gain, that's ideal. So tell, tell us more about this cool gut. What's in it? What makes it different? Well, first thing is it's designed to work in the stomach and the hindgut. There are very few products that work in both places. Um, but before we get into it, let's look at gastric ulcers and how we score these. So um, one to four, this here on the left, this is normal tissue. 
then we start to get inflammation. So by six hours of feed deprivation, we start to get this inflammation here. And then as we start to erode it away, inflammation is the precursor to everything bad. So you really want to curb that inflammation. So this would be a zero. Um, when we start to get some reddening, it's a one. Two, we start to get lesions. And then three and four, we've got ulcerations, deep lesions. So this was a horse that we did a trial on prior to launching this product. This horse was determined to have grade three ulcers. We didn't change her feeding program. We put her on the cool gut three ounces a day and trailered her from Kentucky to Oklahoma where she competed for a week, trailered her back and within three weeks scoped her again and you can see that there are no lesions and really the veterinarian said they couldn't really even find scar tissue so what's doing this what what's different about cool gut well it's got the calcium that's going to help with the stomach acid it's got yeast that's going to help with the hindgut acid it's got l-glutamine and glycine which are natural amino acids that are going to help with tissue integrity they're going to help to um, rebuild those mucosal cells. It's also got some DHA in it, which is gonna help with inflammation, promote healing, some whey protein concentrate, which also gonna help with that, protecting that gastric mucosa, some moss, which will bind bad bacteria, and some phos, which is also gonna help repair damaged cells. So you can see we've got ingredients there that are gonna repair, we've got ingredients that are gonna buffer. Nothing's turning off the acid, so this product can be fed long-term. So to wrap it all up, the management of our horses is why we have an increased incidence of gastric and colonic ulcers. Horses are designed to eat forage regardless of discipline, regardless of the amount of time they stand in a stall. They're meant to graze 17 hours out of the day. You've got to find a way in your program to make that happen. Don't feed anything less than 1% of body weight. Um, you can feed a lot less grain by adding other calorie sources like oil or a better quality forage and the cool gut. Now, one thing I want to say about the cool gut is um, when horses are on the cool gut, we recommend at least a 30 day supply. But if you don't change the horse's management, if you don't change the things that cause the ulcers, the ulcers will just come back if you stop feeding the cool gut. So um, is hay dunking a sign of ulcers? No, not necessarily uh, a sign of ulcers. Sometimes it's a behavior thing. Um, what causes the spikes of good on the ulcer graph? I would say that horse um, pain got so intense that they started chewing on wood. They started chewing on their bucket. They started chewing some shavings and, and you know, had a peak in saliva. Other questions, type your questions in. I'll unmute it if it's too noisy, I'll have to mute everybody again, but best way to do is type your questions in. I know we have some callers, so if you have questions, go ahead. Suzanne, yes, go ahead. Um, I have a question about what would cause the I can't hear anything you're saying. What would cause the cecum to be inflamed with fluid? What would cause the cecum to be inflamed with fluid? Oh, any number of things. Um, the cecum is a blind sack, so it's very easy for stuff to get stuck in there. And one of the things you'll notice burn yourself. The first thing your body does is fluid starts to come to that area. That fluid is bringing um, nutrients to the area. It's bringing good blood cells. It's bringing macrophages. It's bringing all the things that you need to heal that area. So the fact that fluid comes to an area means that we're bringing nutrients to heal something. Whatever caused that, um, it could have been... You know, there's there's a multitude of different reasons, um, but those bacteria got out of balance. Maybe there is some damage to the to the lining of the tissue there. So as to the cause, without looking in there, I don't know. But the fact that fluid comes is a result of the body trying to heal itself. 
Um, many equine dentists say slow grazes people make are causing poor, pe poor teeth and dental issues. And I think that would probably go towards those metal um, ones that use a, a metal mesh because the horses are gnashing against metal, which is not natural. So using the, um, the ones that are more like a bungee or a hay net, um, then they, they are probably uh, more preferable to equine dentists. So how can we prevent that? Just unlimited hay? How can we prevent what, Tiffany? Um, please extra expand on your, your question. Is cool gut safe for pregnant mares? Absolutely cool gut is safe for pregnant mares. It's safe for every horse. There's nothing in it that will test on any horse, um, nothing unsafe at all. It's all just naturally occurring ingredients that we've put in higher quantities. I have a question. This is Paula. Hi, Paula. Go ahead. Paula's gone quiet. Hello. Paula, we can't hear you yet. Go ahead. Um, so I have an orphan foal that's be 30 days next week. And we're, I got him on digestive aid. I've got him on um, the probiotics. And so about every three or four days, we get the raging poops. Mm -hmm. And then I have to give him bio sponge. Can I give him some of this cool gut? Absolutely. The problem with something like bio sponge is it doesn't fix the root of the problem. Right. It binds up the water so you don't have, you know, if nothing is working, I'll recommend BioSponge. If we just have this liquid diarrhea that's burning the horse's legs and we've just got to stop it really quickly. Um, mm -hmm. But it doesn't fix the root of the problem. So it's not going to heal any tissue or anything. It's just going to bind up water so you don't have it coming out. So absolutely, right. given that, that that was Marielle data on the incidence of ulcers, I would absolutely feed that little guy um, cool gut now he's not a thousand pounds he's just little so i right. just try and do an ounce a day with him okay awesome i'm gonna try it because i'm going broke with the stuff that's not working every three days <laughs> great thanks great question i'm gonna read some more questions here um is it appropriate to feed that cool gut daily year round absolutely you can do that um and especially in disciplines like barrel racing, where you really don't have a time off, you're competing your horses year round, you're doing a lot with them. Um, you're not taking away the stresses, you're still at, um, transporting them, that kind of thing, then absolutely it is safe and can be fed year round. Do you have to? No, because some horses will um, have time off, some horses get turned out, you know, so you don't have to, but you absolutely can. Not really a question, but a praise to the cool gut. It has done a 180 on a training horse um, as it, from a week. Excellent. That's really good to hear. Um, after fighting an impaction colic for four plus days, would you suggest some cool gut with the DDA? Um, at vet, they said horse off feed for three days. It was nine days till normal stool. Um, now, the cool gut has no benefit for a horse that's colicking or an impaction, um, but all of the stress of that horse probably being in a vet hospital, absolutely, the cool gut will be beneficial, not for the colic, but for the implications of a horse being in a, in a vet hospital. Um, I have a horse with a, a client with a horse that gets enteroliths and has colicked twice. She is going to start oil because he's losing weight. And we are also talking about DDA. I know that horses that get enteroliths cannot have an abundance of some minerals. Is the DDA safe? Absolutely. And I was also add about a tablespoon of salt to the horse's diet every day. You've got to get that horse to drink water. Um, that's going to be a huge help with enteroliths is getting them to drink more, more water. 
How much would you recommend for minis on the cool gut? I'm going to say probably a half an ounce a day. I mean, you can work it out. It's one, it's three ounces per thousand pounds. So work out how heavy your mini is and back calculate. If feeding cool gut and digestive, is feeding cool gut and digestive aid overkill with young horses I have in training? No, because they, ha they actually serve two different purposes. The digestive aid also has a mold inhibitor and a lot in it, um, which the cool gut does not. Um, so they're not overkill. They certainly can be fed together. It's not a problem at all. Excellent. I appreciate you all signing on and we will see you at our next webinar.